Okay, so we're going to continue this um, session with a, another invited speaker, um, Jonathan Holm from ETH in Zurich. Welcome, Jonathan. I assume you're. It's good morning for yourself. It is indeed. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, Jonathan is a man of mystery. Okay, as you'll see from the program, he's trying to keep us in sus in suspense. We do not know what the talk title is, but I believe it does have something to do with iron traps, hopefully. Indeed. So yeah. please, take it away. We're looking forward to an impressive um, talk from yourself. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I don't know quite why my title in abstract didn't make it to the program because I sent them, but uh, I will just tell you them. So the title of the talk is actually uh, Error Correction of a Logical uh, Gottesman Guitar of Preskill Qubit by Dissipation. Uh, and the basic notion is building on some work we did a few years ago. And what you see on this first slide, if you like, is a Wigner function of the oscillatory motion of a single trapped iron. And you can think along the bottom that you have uh, the coordinate, the position, uh, let me call it Q, uh, and up the vertical axis that you have the momentum. And you see here a grid-like structure of either negative or positive points. Uh, and that actually uh, is some experimental reconstruction of states that we made uh, back in 2018 or so, reported in this paper here. Uh, and it's uh, the example of a code state for an error correction code from a, a rather nice scheme made by uh, Daniel Godsman, Alexei Kitava, and John Preskill back in uh, early 2000s, if you like. And back when we took this first data, um, then I didn't really know how we might be able to do any error correction on these code states, though we could create the states and we could actually do arbitrary manipulations of the qubit. Um, but I'm happy uh, today to be able to tell you about uh, how we do now uh, are able to do error correction of this logical qubit. Uh, and that's in an article that's just appeared on the archive uh, this morning. So with that, uh, let's think about what have we have to do in order to perform quantum uh, error correction. So a qubit, of course, is fully defined, uh, or we can define a pure state of a qubit by a, a, a state vector. And if we look at the density matrix, in a sense, it tells us that it's fully defined by these Pauli uh, operators. So if we think what we are doing, if we're storing a qubit, and if we want to uh, detect whether errors have happened on a qubit, what we don't want is that our measurements of errors disturb the logical information. And so we need to be able to measure this system that we have in a way that won't disturb stored information. And what that means is we need to be able to measure operators which will detect errors, but will commute with all of the Pauli operators. Otherwise, we ourselves will corrupt our stored information. And so that tells you that you have to have a Hilbert space that's bigger than just a bare uh, qubit system. Uh, and there's two strong sort of candidates that people think in terms of. One is making a bigger Hilbert space by using lots of uh, physical qubits. Uh, so that would be by using multipartite entangled states. Uh, and the other way that you can expand your Hilbert space is you can use a physical system that's got a naturally larger Hilbert space. And indeed, that's what I'm going to talk about today. That's a, an oscillator, in our case, a mechanical uh, trapped ion oscillator. Uh, and of course, in its uh, uh, continuous degrees of freedom, it has a, essentially an infinite Hilbert space. So we can make use of that redundancy to store and manipulate uh, logical qubits. So the particular code I'm going to talk about is this proposal from Gottesman, Kataev, and Preskill. Uh, which is based around uh, what I would call displacement uh, operators. And a key feature of displacement operators here, this e to the i alpha q is a displacement in the momentum direction. e to the L i beta p is a displacement in the uh, position direction. So I'm representing the position operator by q, momentum by p here, is that when you interchange the order, and all I've done here is to swap the order, you get a phase factor. So they don't in general uh, commute with each other, but rather they produce an additional phase. Nevertheless, under certain choices of alpha and beta, uh, these operators can commute. Uh, and so, for instance, if alpha beta is an even multiple of pi, here's e to the 2 pi i, i uh, that's just one, right? And then you get that these operators commute. 
And conversely, if alpha and beta are an odd multiple of pi, then these operators anti-commute. And so that's the basis for this construction of Gottesman, Kitaev, and Preskill for a stabilizer code, in which the notion is that you choose uh, alpha and beta, if you like, to be uh, displacements on a perpendicular displacements on a grid. And the logical operators then become unit displacements on this grid. Uh, and for x, it would be in a displacement in position. Uh, and for z, it would be a displacement in momentum. And then the phase that you get here uh, is somehow proportional to the area that you can think of as being subtended by these displacements. And this phase is the thing that in the case of logical operators should be arranged such that they anti-commute. So it should be an odd multiple of uh, pi. Then what do you want? You want also stabilizer operators. These are our error check operators, which are going to commute with all the logical uh, operators. And so to do that, then what you need is a phase which essentially is a factor of two larger, because a phase that's a factor of two larger will uh, satisfy an even number of pi. So what you see is that that can be arranged by having double the displacement. So for instance, if Sx is this large, then you can think that the area subtended is now uh, twice the size, uh, and that will then give us a situation in which, for instance, Sx commutes with the z logical operator, which it has to do to satisfy the needs of these error check operators. So by design, uh, these sets of displacements, perpendicular displacements on this grid in phase space, satisfy the desired commutation relations for our error check and logical Pauli operators. So now we have to think what are the code states of these displacements and what are the, how, do, how does the error correction, what's it aiming to do? So essentially the code is aiming to prevent or uh, protect against displacements of the oscillator. And these would be just shifts in the phase space, small displacements in the phase space. Uh, and the key to that is that the logical uh, code states, and here I just plot in uh, momentum, are, they have to be eigenstates of the stabilizers and they have to be eigenstates of the logical operator. Yeah, So a logical code state, the zero logical state, has to have the spacing of the stabilizer, but is essentially a periodic array uh, extending off into infinity, actually, for the ideal code states, uh, spaced by the stabilizer displacement to root pi. And then the uh, logical one operator, and again, I'll just plot it in position, sits halfway between these two. And so what can we see from that? We can see that if we displace the zero logical by half the stabilizer distance, we would shift the whole state to the side such that we would get a, a logical one. And that's the x operation, the log x logical operation. But this logical one uh, um, state is also a superposition of uh, infinitely squeezed states, if you like, spaced by two root pi, which is the stabilizer. So let's say that this is the error-free state. Okay, I've drawn them with a little bit of width, so that's uh, not quite true for an infinite uh, GKP state. But if errors occur, the basic notion is that errors cause shifts either in momentum or position. And if they diffuse in position, then what you find is that each of these peaks gets uh, broadened. Yeah, And if they get broadened, then these peaks start to overlap each other. And where they start to overlap, that's when you could get a logical error probability in a sense. Uh, because what's going to happen next is that we take a look at this state for the error correction, and we try and squeeze it back so that it, it sits around these peaks here. And you can see that if the tail of this peak had, had come over onto the right-hand side, our best interpretation should be that we try and squeeze it back uh, to this peak rather than squeezing it back to this one, and that would flip uh, something contributing to the one logical state to contributing to the zero state. Yeah. So the aim of the error correction essentially is to squeeze these uh, peaks back up again so that everything stays uh, with very small overlap between 0 and 1. And we make mistakes if the broadening got too much that we end up correcting to the wrong peak. So that's the basic notion of how the error correction works. I've also told you how the uh, logical operations work. So one of the ways that we uh, think about this is that we, uh, in position, this is the position axis, would have to sharpen these peaks in order to do error correction. 
And then actually we have to do the corresponding thing in momentum. Uh, also in momentum, these states are periodic arrays of peaks, if you like, uh, and we have to go to momentum and also sharpen the peaks. Okay, so how do we do this, uh, or how do we measure these states? And it's linked to the way in which we're going to do the quantum error correction. So um, what we do in the lab, so this top line is the motional state of our atom, so it's an oscillator state. This bottom state is actually an ancilla, so it's an internal two-state system. So it's an ancillary qubit stored in the internal states of our ion. And this is a very classic type stabilizer readout. You've got a couple of Hadamard gates and you've got this controlled uh, operation happening, which happens to be a displacement operation happening on the oscillator. Um, and that in trapped ions is realized in a fairly simple way. All of the stuff in that dashed box can be realized just by applying two laser frequencies, which are resonant with what we call the, uh, the blue and red motional sidebands. So these are just the modulation sidebands. So the oscillation of the atom modulates the phase of the laser that interacts with the atom, and you get their modulation sidebands. And if you drive resonantly on two of those with the same strength, you get this Hamiltonian here, which couples the spin operator, that's the ancilla uh, X operator, to something controlling the oscillator, right? And the oscillator here, I can choose the phase by choosing the phase of the laser beam, but you can see if I chose phi equal to zero, I get A dagger plus A, which is just the position uh, operator. So I can think of this block as just doing this e to the a unitary, which is just e to the i alpha times the position of the oscillator times the x operator on the ancilla. And alpha is chosen by the amount of time that I apply this state-dependent force. So let's think about what this operation is doing on the ancilla. So essentially what it's doing is it's a, it's a rotation, right? e to the i something times the uh, Pauli operator is a rotation. And indeed, what it's doing, if I start in the uh, z, the plus z state, is it's rotating me about the x-axis of the block sphere. And the rotation angle is proportional to the position of the oscillator. Yeah? And so I can think now after that that I'm able to measure my uh, atom in either the z basis or I can measure it in the y basis. And that will give me a different projection, essentially, uh, of the uh, rotation that I have here. And if I look at the expectation values for these two projections on the ancilla, I see that the, uh, the, the expectation values, if you like, are given by just the expectation value of the oscillator state evaluated on modular functions, either cos or sine, of something related to the position of the oscillator. Yeah? So here I'm getting some sort of information uh, in the z or y uh, components, which is proportional to just the expectation value actually of either the real part of a displacement operator or the imaginary part of the displacement operator. So what sort of states do we apply these measurements to? We apply them to these finite uh, GKP states. So instead of here having infinite superpositions of peaks, what we have is a Gaussian, uh, a sum of peaks with Gaussian weights. Yeah. So there's some sort of envelope there. Uh, and each of the peaks is finitely uh, squeezed. And how do we realize these? In general, we realize these by creating a superposition of three squeeze states, uh, which have been displaced relative to each other. And in fact, that's the original plot that I showed is just a reconstruction of the position uh, and momentum of three superposed squeeze states, which forms an approximation to these approximate uh, gottesman kataev uh, preskill states. So just as a quick point, so these states are interesting, right, in the sense that they're squeezed actually in two dimensions, yeah? So the peaks here are squeezed by 5.6 and 7.3 dB in our experiment, uh, though there's no violation of Heisenberg here. The key thing is that uh, we always have superpositions of many peaks in order to maintain such a level of squeezing. So these are finite states, and that causes a problem in the measurement. And let me just describe that problem now. So one of the things you're trying to do is you're trying to make a measurement of this cosine operator uh, on the motion. And in order to do that, then what we did was we applied an operator, which was e to the i alpha q x. And what that is, uh, q, yeah, sorry, x. 
And what that is, is actually a displacement along the momentum direction. So if we look at our original GKP state and we look in the momentum quadrature now, we would find that applying this operation has actually split up our state into two parts that are entangled with the X quadrature, uh, but now don't have perfect overlap between each other. So now my story of the rotation of the spin is a bit compl complicated because of the entanglement between the spin and the oscillate. And you can see that in the data from our old experiment, if you like, uh, and that lead, limits the readout of logical operators, which are just displacement operators, and also the stabilizer operators. And you see that here. Uh, what you see is that the drop here happens every time uh, the two sets of peaks don't overlap with each other. But every time the peaks do overlap, we get a revival, but the revival is imperfect here because this envelope does not perfectly overlap with the envelope of the other state. And as we push these states further apart in order to measure a stabilizer, then this overlap gets worse and even gets worse further out. We don't care so much about these points here. So the take home message from that is that there's a bad performance coming in here because of this entanglement between in the X basis between the spin and the motion. And that actually is something that also complicates the error correction. And now, uh, there's a beautiful paper that was recently out from the Yale group performing error correction on these GKP uh, codes, where, again, they used measurements similar to this and were limited in the same way uh, in their readout, but also had to add additional features to do the error correction. So um, one of our new steps, if you like, is to come up with a way of uh, beating or coming up with appropriate measurements that are better suited to the finite states that we use. And the trick here really is to notice that um, the reason we get this separation of wave packets is that each peak in this sum gets an equal probability to be pushed to the right or pushed to the left. And so our new method essentially says, well, uh, if you want to maintain the envelope that you get for these two uh, displaced peaks, if you like, what you want to do is to predict that that's going to happen but now bias whether the state gets pushed to the left or the right by its position in momentum. I.e., If I'm already at positive momentum, well, I should have a bias in the X basis before I do this pulse. That means I'm more likely to push towards the origin than I am to go out to larger values. And so what we see is by preceding the main measurement unitary by this uh, uh, adjustment unitary, we can actually realize something where the envelope is well maintained for the two different copies that we get. And this helps. So here's logical a measurement of a logical operator. It's a minus one uh, logical state of Z, if you like. And here's the theory curve. And you see it really helps a lot. This is if we didn't have this adjustment pulse, we would get about a 90% readout fidelity. But with the adjustment pulse, this is value close to 99.9% .9 readout fidelity. Now, the experiments, this is an experiment where we've uh, measured this. And you see we agree with the optimal value uh, for this uh, bias. But what you see is that we, of course, don't do as well as 99.9. .9, and that's because of uh, errors in the state preparation and uh, dephasing before we make the measurement. That also can be applied to the stabilizer. And here, the gain is also quite significant, right? So uh, here, the stabilizer with no adjustment would be 0.67 and it can go up to better than 90%. And in our case, in our experiment, we go from about 50% stabilizer readout up to close to 80% by using these new finite uh, measurements. So that can also be used in the error correction. But uh, in order to explain that, I want to tell you how the error correction might work. And this is really a method introduced by the Yale group in their microwave circuits, but where we apply it also in our trapped iron uh, setting. So um, just note that the measurements I told you about, if I measure in the Y basis, I get something which is a, um, a an operator which was sine two alpha times the position. Yeah? And if I consider making that on a position eigenstate, then this essentially gives me a conditional probability. And my probability for getting plus Y is just a sinusoidal curve with respect to the position of my oscillator. And to get minus Y is the counter to that. And I can use that as a conditional probability for a Bayesian update. So let me show you how that works. We start with an initial state. But now after applying the measurement and conditioning on getting a plus or minus y, 
what we would find is that the states that are associated with that are now these modified Gaussians, which are either shifted to the right or have been shifted to the left. And the way I can predict those in a classical theory would be to say they're just given by a Bayesian update, which is just the conditional probability uh, multiplied by my prior. So now what do you see? You see that depending on the measurement outcome, I've got a shifted Gaussian. So if I want to now uh, correct, then what do I see? Or, or what should I next do if I want to come up with a narrowed version of this original Gaussian? Well, I have to push these back to the origin. So I apply a correction pulse then that has to displace me uh, back to the origin. And if I do that, then the final result is a Gaussian, which is now a narrow distribution with respect to the initial distribution. And remember, that's exactly what I wanted for the error correction. Now, this was all in the position quadrature. And the problem is that in performing the measurement that gives me these conditional probabilities on finite GKP states, I make my envelope of the GKP state bigger in the momentum quadrature. And this is what complicated the situation for the uh, Yale group. So they had these uh, rounds that did sharpening. So that's really what the error correction is that I've just described to you for position and momentum. But then they had to introduce additional steps that were just made such that they could rescue their state uh, from the um, enlarging of the envelope. Yeah. So this was uh, their challenge. It means that every error correction cycle uh, con consists of four uh, readout and and or well, four detection steps with uh, then a control displacement from their readout. So with our finite measurements, we can actually uh, reduce that. So we now uh, actually realize it through a dissipative map. So we first apply the unit tree for this finite. Uh, readout. So you see that here's the epsilon that I've included here. This would be the stabilizer measurement. Uh, and then actually we don't do detection as such, but we apply a conditional displacement from the spin back onto the motion to do the correction. That's the uh, correction result. And then we reset our uh, internal state of our atom. And the reason we do that is that if we want to detect the internal state of the atom, we have to scatter about 3,000 photons, and that's a lot of recoil on the oscillator. Whereas if we just do spin reset, we have two scattered photons. So that's not very much, and we can cope with that within the code. So we apply that in both position uh, and then in the momentum quadrature. Uh, and then how do we choose the epsilon and mu settings? So this is the displacement for the correction, and this is the displacement for the epsilon, what we do is we just say that a logical zero state that doesn't have any error on it should be uncorrupted or as well as possible uncorrupted. So this is actually the map uh, from our error correction acting on a logical zero state. Uh, that produces row one, and then we look at the fidelity with the initial state. And so you see that in this graph here. Here's the fidelity on the right-hand side for states of similar size to what we use. If epsilon is equal to zero, then a single cycle of error correction will destroy the state to some degree, even if it was perfect, and produce only a 95% fidelity. But if we uh, use a value of epsilon and we make it equal to mu, and we have it at around 0.04, we can get that fidelity being up into the three nines, or, uh, or yeah, into the third decimal place. Okay, so does it work? Here is uh, our measurements of stabilizers or uh, as a function of the number of cycles of error correction that we apply. And one thing we see that's pleasing uh, is that we get fast onset. So here we start the system actually off in the ground state of the oscillator, and we then just apply the error correction, and we see that it quickly, within a few rounds, stabilizes uh, to an 80% value for the stabilizer. And then if we keep on correcting, we see that the stabilizers are completely stable out to hundreds of rounds. So this is only going to 100 rounds. We do it for more. Whereas if we turn off the stabilization over a similar, over these sort of time scales, uh, time scales of 40 rounds, we see a dramatic collapse uh, of the stabilizer values due to dephasing and, and, and diffusion of the state. So of course, that's the stabilizers. What we would really like to know is can we improve logical coherence? And so we apply a similar experiment now, but we monitor as a function of the number of cycles the uh, logical uh, operators for logical eigenstates that we pair. 
So these dashed curves and this data here is showing uh, X and Z and the Y data for a square GKP code, uh, which where we haven't applied the stabilization. And then uh, this data here is where we are applying the stabilization. And what you see is that the coherence has been uh, significantly lengthened. In fact, with no stabilization, we get coherence times on the level of uh, two, two and a half milliseconds. And with the stabilization, we improve that up to, so for the Y quadrature, which is the worst, it's about 8.6 milliseconds. Uh, and for the others, it's around 12. So here is a factor of three and a half extension of the logical coherence time in our system. So where do we go from there? So we've been able to demonstrate then the extension of a logical qubit coherence time through the use of this autonomous GKP error correction that we've designed. Uh, what we see is that we're actually limited by um, in performance uh, by still by the 50 hertz components uh, of trap frequency noise. So that's frequency noise in the oscillator. Uh, and the dashed lines here are somehow from, coming from characterized noise, but this is a model of what that would do to a GKP state. Uh, and we can see how the improvements, that's the solid lines, would be if we only had that particular uh, noise uh, source. So what we see, if we could only get the situation where dephasing isn't limiting us, then we could see probably a pretty dramatic increase in, in coherence time. This would be if we just had motional heating of our iron, and then if we did error correction on it. But at the moment, we're limited by these components, and so those are things that we have to work on. The other thing we'd like to do is examine other codes. So there are um, codes like CAT codes, which are better suited to dealing with dephasing noise. And as you somehow see, that's probably dominating us in the setup that we have at the moment. Another further remark I would make, and it's work that we're just writing up at the moment, but is uh, fairly similar in notion, is that this narrowing of a Gaussian is not something that's unique to GKP error correction, but rather is another take on laser cooling. So Gaussian density matrices are also what you have in thermal states of an oscillator. And what we find there is that actually it's an extremely efficient way of extracting uh, entropy from an oscillator in the sense that every time you repump a spin, uh, you dissipate an amount of entropy that's only a factor of four or so from the sort of fundamental limit of KB log two that you would expect uh, from spin reset. So uh, that's kind of an intriguing different angle, if you like, that we have on this sort of work. Uh, and we're still searching for sequences that would make take us to the ultimate efficiency. And in fact, here's actually experimental data of the exponential reduction of uh, n bar of an oscillator with number of cycles, uh, which is then coming from this modular variable laser cooling, essentially. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I also want to thank the people who did the work, and in particular, in, in my group, that's um, um, Brennan uh, Deneve, San Long, and uh, Guyen, uh, and Tanya Bailey, who were involved in this experiment. So thanks, and I look forward to any questions that you have. So Jonathan, impressive results. It's really nice to see the GKP code working as well as, as, well as it is. So, I mean, so I have a, a very, I won't say simple question, but I mean, how long with the GKP code can you protect your logical qubit? What's your feeling? So you're showing that you're, you're past the point where error correction is working, but obviously if I want to do computation or something longer term, I need to protect these qubits for a long, long time. So where do you think the limit is? Yeah, I mean, maybe I just, in case there's a misinterpretation. So uh, this is, uh, just to be clear, that this is a decay of a GKP state while we're yeah. while we're not correcting it, right? If we yeah. just look at our bare oscillator, we actually get a sort of 16 millisecond coherence time for a low energy superposition. So just the Fox state zero and one. So we're not yet at break even point, if you like, from that point of view. But I mean, one thing that's kind of nice about the GKP uh, error correction is that most of the operations you do on the code states are displacements. Yeah? yeah. So in that sense, then if you make a mistake in amplitudes of displacements, then they, these somehow are correctable errors. Yeah. Uh, these are the things that the code corrects. Nevertheless, what we see at the moment, I think, is that we're sort of if you like, the only thing we can do is apply the error correction as fast as possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and actually, one of the great things that would happen if we could get to the level of noise that's associated with sort of 
the natural limit in our system, which is this heating, is that we would start to be in a regime where we didn't have to apply the error correction all the time as fast as possible. Uh, and that would probably leave us feeling that we have a bit more space for doing operations and things. Yeah? I think the other thing to say is that, you know, the I think I know how to do single qubit gates. In fact, we've done many single qubit gates, uh, but we do see an increase of logical errors when we're doing some of these operations because they usually involve um, sort of half displacement. So during the gate, you're sort of uh, maybe in the middle of phase space. And if you don't do things properly, you can create your own errors in a certain sense. So I think we have a little way to go before this is like really genuinely useful, but of course it's nice to see this initial signature that we can extend coherence. I mean, it's a beautiful progress. I mean, really amazing results. So to keep our program on time, I want to thank you for your presentation today. I mean, you'll find a few questions in the question and answer session that I hope you can answer for yeah. our people. I audience. hope I can too, yeah. And I look, um, I think we need to move to the next speaker. So really, thank you. Great talk. Thank you.